Hello and welcome. My name is David Slyker and I'm the president of the International House of Prayer University. I'm here with my dear friend Isaac Bennett, He's the lead pastor of Foreigner Church. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, dude. Love being here with you. So, so fun, fun to do this. Well, we have uh, been talking about um, the, the conversation that we feel like the Holy Spirit is driving in our midst related to what He's emphasizing and revealing, related to His will, His mm -hmm. plans for this time frame of history. What, you know, what's the Spirit saying is the big question, and how do we engage in the future goes right there with it. And so the Lord's been helping us as a spiritual family, as a team, to emphasize key passages that we've been spending time in as a spiritual family, and we're wanting to bring others into the conversation. And one of those passages that really surprised us that the Holy Spirit kind of emphasized out of the blue in a very clear and profound way is Luke 4.18, mm -hmm. specifically that passage and the, the promises and the dynamics that surround that passage. And so when the Lord emphasized Luke 4.18, for you, I've noticed that you've been studying it, you've been praying it in our prayer room. What stands out to you as a point of emphasis related to how we engage with that passage? I think what you said, how the Lord will prophetically emphasize a passage and bring it to the forefront of the consciousness of this little community at least, in a, in a significant way. We're supposed to pay attention to it because the Lord is highlighting it in a dramatic way and He's highlighting it again to us actually because in our history Luke 418 was a massive part of the conversation as things were unfolding here in Kansas City related to the vineyard movement, related to the prophetic movement. And matter of fact I was thinking about the story of Mike and John Wimber and Paul Kane, how the Lord brings together the Kansas City Prophets with the Vineyard Movement, Worship and Compassion, and Luke 4.18 is right in the middle of that conversation as many, many people in the body of Christ, particularly in the Vineyard Movement, are tracking with the promise of Luke 4.18 being released. It is interesting how the Lord, a generation before us in essence of right. leaders and pastors, this conversation that the Lord's brought us into is one He's been having for a while. Right. That, that's really what you're saying. Right. That there are churches and leaders and believers all over the body of Christ that He got their attention on it. Got, you know, now they're waiting for something that when it kind of inserted itself into our conversation, caught us off guard because it's mm. new to us. Mm -hmm. But again, this is a... It's, it's, you can almost call it a hundred-year-old story, a hundred-year-old promise. And it's around Luke 4.18, the, which if you don't know the passage, it's where the Lord walks into the synagogue and He's chosen to do the daily reading and He's handed the scroll. He takes the scroll. It's pretty dramatic the way that Luke tells it. Jesus opens up the scroll and, and reads a prophetic promise from Isaiah about Himself. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news. He's anointed me to proclaim liberty to captives, sight to the blind, set free liberty to the oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the Jubilee year. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so that proclamation, it's one of the most dramatic moments in all of Scripture. And the, the kind of underlying part that I don't know was emphasized in the vineyard years is that the ones that were listening didn't understand what was happening. They didn't get that the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Son of God was reading a prophecy about Himself, proclaiming that this is the moment that it begins, and they miss the hour of their visitation. Yeah. And so we don't talk about that a lot. We mostly talk about the promise of, if it's Luke 8, Luke 4, 18, if that's what the Lord's doing, we don't talk about the possibility that we might miss what the Lord's doing. We talk about, we want to see the healing, the power, the signs and wonders, the healing of broken hearts, the restoration of families. We kind of more focus on the power dimension of what's possible by the Spirit that Jesus has been anointed to do through the church. But, uh, but again, there's, a, there's an element of you can miss this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that's striking me from this passage is the Lord wanting to convince the body of Christ that He is anointed by the Father with the Holy Spirit and with power, Acts 10 tells us, and that He wants the confidence of the church 
to be placed fully in the anointing and the power that flows through Jesus. Because Jesus, as he receives the anointing of the Father, he says later in Matthew 28, he says, All authority has been given to me by my Father. And he's commissioning them to go out and operate in that same authority. We see this in the sending out of the 70. We see this in the sending out of the 12. We see this in the Acts chapter 1 where he says, I'm going to endue you with the Holy Spirit and power from on high. And so we know that there are promises of healing and power that are coming to a level that we cannot yet comprehend. You know, when Jesus says in John chapter 14, he says, you're going to do greater works than these. And you're going to do them in my name. And the works that he's talking about are the works of Christ himself. And so when we think as the body of Christ, you know, asking the Lord, Lord, give us power. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to see miracles. We want to see uh, uh, prof the prophetic ministry increase. We want to see the, uh, uh, you know, casting out demons increase, the sight, recovery to the blind, et cetera, et cetera. Often we don't think of our confidence being fully in Jesus and the work that he does. And wow. so as I've been wrestling with this, I'm contending for these promises to happen. I want the anointing to increase upon the body of Christ across the missions movement, the prayer movement, local churches, pastors, evangelists, etc. But what I'm hoping for is a shift that the body of Christ would get out of her spiritual lethargy and self-dependence and actually look to Christ, which that's what his name means, the anointed one. Wow. And so I think that it's connected into the revelation of Jesus breaking in upon our generation. I think it has to do with reorienting the, the confidence base of the body of Christ, not in our resources and natural abilities or talents, but reorienting them into the person of Christ so that he can release that same anointing. Imagine if the anointing that Jesus himself walked in began to operate through the body of Christ, but in a consistent measure and in a consistent way. That's what I'm contending for. And I'm contending that the heart of the church would shift towards him, that we would actually believe that he was anointed by the Father and that he was anointed with power to advance the kingdom of heaven in this day and age. And so those are just some of the things that I'm stirred up about. Uh, what I love about it is that you're stirred up about, first and foremost, the way that the passage is about Jesus and about connecting us to Jesus yes. in this way. Yes. That, that is unique, uh, I'm sure you know. You know, the, the, even the, the vineyard prayer movement swirl of the 80s and this passage was about the Lord empowering the church to do these things. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, in a different vein, the social justice world of the church, this passage means something totally different. It's about the anointing to bring justice to society. But that Jesus is anointed and therefore we need to engage with him and connect with his heart and who he is and to, you know, to, the way I said it earlier was it's possible to miss it, but when I hear you, it's more, it's possible to miss him. Yeah, that's right. In that's terms of the activity, right. the healing, the justice, don't miss him. Yeah, because I think when we look at things like the Great Commission or promises of revival and the great harvest of souls across the nations, we can just go into our boardrooms and go, well, how do we strategize to do this? How can we pull our resources how can we you know, get together with other ministries for collaboration and unity to accomplish the purposes of God? And that's not where our hope is meant to lie. It's meant to lie in the fact that Jesus stands over the nations of the earth and he stands over your city and my city and the promises over our cities and the promises of the harvest of souls are his promises. So good. And he's anointed to accomplish those promises with such power, with such authority, that everybody puts the blame on him. Everybody goes, you did this, Jesus. That's what I'm stirred up about, is that we would look to him, and when we look to him, all the more, and I'm finding this in the place of prayer, praying this passage, is that when I'm looking to him, the faith and my confidence goes up because it's not connected to man's power and man's authority, but the son of man's power, the son of man's authority, and he stands over America and he stands over the nations and he goes, I have been anointed by my father to accomplish my father's will. Will you trust me? Will you believe that I have the authority, that I will release the provision, that I will qualify the leaders, which is Zechariah 3, that I will do what my father has anointed me to do. I will draw all men unto myself. 
And it just is causing me to see differently, to pray differently, to preach differently, because I know they're his promises, not just mine and not just yours. They're his. To see them that way really reorients you because we shift into, like, like when I think of the church in the 80s, not just the vineyard movement or the prayer movement, when I think of the church as it relates to the Holy Spirit, or when I think of the social justice movement, Again, a, an accidental man-centered view of this passage takes the promise and puts the initiative on me right. to go do it. Right, exactly. Versus the, versus the mandate to watch and pray and respond when Jesus is doing what he's going to do. Yes. And engage with him from a place of patient waiting, not a place of trying to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think the Lord is inviting the body of Christ into this. I mean, we know so many of the New Testament apostolic prayers are filled with, Lord, give us revelation of Jesus. We want to see what he's doing. We want to hear what he's saying. When he stretches out his hand to the sick, that's where I want to be stretching out my hand to the sick. Wow. When he is proclaiming the gospel to the person that does not know him, that's where I want to be proclaiming the gospel. And I think it's as much about the Lord releasing an anointing onto the church as it is about orienting the church in that same relationship, that same conversation that he and the Father had, where he goes, I only say what the Father says. I'm only doing what the Father is doing. And so if the church, I think, can buy into the fact that he is the anointed one to accomplish the Great Commission, to accomplish the salvation of Israel, to accomplish the great harvest in the nations of the earth, I think it bolsters us and positions us in just a different way of strength and faith. That's beautiful. It really is true of all the passages we're looking at. We think that being a good Christian is about going out and doing it right. And what you're saying is, no, actually in this hour, as the intensity increases, being a faithful follower of Jesus is actually following. Yes. Actually seeing Him, knowing Him, and responding to what He initiates by right. faith, not trying to make it happen in our own strength. Right, absolutely. Well, Lord, we ask that you would help us Give us patience to wait for you. Give us eyes to see you and a heart to respond in the right time, in the right spirit, in the right way. Yes, God. It, to Luke 4.18 and to all the things that you're saying and doing from the various passages we're discussing, God, I'm asking that you'd give us a heart to respond and not lay hold of something in our own strength that you've been ordained by your Father to do. We ask, help us to lean into you in this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.